Um, okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for um, letting me come and talk um, to you all. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and talk you through um, three sorts of areas around different sorts of approaches to interactional materials. Um, do feel free to um, stick your hand up and ask uh, a question uh, if you want to as we go through. Um, I don't know, most of the data, well some of the data is American sitcom data, so you should be familiar with that. Um, some of the data is, is British data, and, and I'm, I'm learning actually on my, my little US trip so far that some words just don't translate. Um, so you might want to ask me um, some language sorts of questions as well. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, starting um, with the question of the sorts of interactional phenomenon that we can investigate systematically. Um, then thinking more specifically as we go through the talk, um, what sorts of issues are raised by focusing on sequential uh, uh, and or categorical or topic based concerns. So I'm making initially a kind of broad distinction between um, the sorts of sequential things that conversation analysts are interested in, those of you who are familiar with CA. Um, and then um, the way I got into inter in interaction, which wasn't through an interest in, an interest in things like pauses or term construction particularly or um, sequence organization or, or you know, things that my colleagues uh, or, and your colleagues as well probably think of all that kind of tiny detail, like why is it that anyone would care about that stuff? Um, I was interested initially in, in topic type stuff, so gender, you know, big questions. How do you get in? How do you get kind of big identity sorts of questions and things into an interactional analysis, and, and why would you do that kind of analysis? So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about as we go through, um, and then I'm going to finish the talk with a final um, section. Um, it's not that neat a segue actually, but, but it's what I'm kind of looking at at the moment and it's one of the reasons I'm over here, which is how we can be relevant in a, in a kind of academic and general political climate, I guess the same in the US as the UK, where how relevant are you? Okay, so you're doing all this close interactional work, but like who cares and, and who in the real world might care? Um, so I'm over here at the moment on a, on a, a government research council grant doing useful things for mediation services. So I thought I would talk a little bit about that because it's the kind of thing that conversation analysts and interaction analysts might be interested in seeing ways that we can be useful in the real world and, and show that we're not doing just stuff that's kind of piddling around um, with, with hand scripts. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to start off um, with two clips from Friends. Um, I'm hoping that you all know Friends, you should all know Friends, although some of you are probably too young for when it came out, but anyway, it's, yeah, I like this data for, for just getting you into interactional stuff, whether or not um, you know anything about, anything technical um, about conversation analysis in particular. Um, so um, I guess the question for the first extract for you to think about as the extract plays is why the audience are laughing where they laugh. So for those of you unfamiliar with Friends, um, this is... Um, American sitcom based in New York. Um, here we have a character, Ross, um, and this is the very first episode in the whole run of programs. And he um, has just been, I think, jilted at the altar. Those of you who know the, the scripts can remind me, but he's been, he, he basically was going to get married, didn't get married, um, and also, and is moving into a new apartment. Um, and then also the character that we're going to see here, Rachel, has also just not got married. And it turns out as well that we, we found out later that he has a crush of long standing um, on Rachel. But, but basically what we're going to see here is Ross inviting Rachel over to his house to do some DIY, put some shelves together. That's basically what you're going to see. Okay, so the question is, why is the audience laughing at a particular junction that I'm gonna, we're going to get to at the end? Okay, so forget the bits that I've chopped out. Obviously, I've chopped them out for a reason. Our interest is in, this is the kind of thing that conversation analysts can be interested in, which is how is it that a course of action is built up and followed through to a sort of resolution. So here we have a kind of a pre-sequence. So we, we all know that when someone says, so what are you doing tonight? So an invitation might be on its way. Okay. One of the things friends and, well, and sitcoms in, gem, in general will do very often is set up something that looks like it's going to be something like an invitation, and then it doesn't forthcome, um, and, then, and then you get the laughter. And how do we know when to laugh? The laughter is, so, so we have the, 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 the pre-setting up 
um, what are you up to tonight? Rachel, well, she's sitting there in a wedding dress. She was supposed to be, you know, getting married on her way to the honeymoon, and that's funny, but what, she, what she's basically saying is, I'm free tonight. Um, and then Ross at four and five, um, if you don't feel like being alone tonight, um, and kind of sideways, uh, we can see this as her, in, sort of inviting her to join Joey and Chandler to come over uh, and help mm -hmm. them put together the furniture. And then Rachel does something which we all recognize, which is turning down an invitation. And she does it in a very recognizable way, which is a kind of polite way to do it. Well, thank you, but you know, so doing an appreciation of the invitation and then giving an account as to why it is that she's not gonna come. And this is a very understandable account, given that she's just, you know, uh, not got married today. It's a fairly big thing, she might wanna just stay home. Um, and then we have the kind of re, in a, a, another version of the invitation. Um, issued by Joey uh, to Phoebe, who's also in the room, another character. And the contrast we have is between Rachel being asked and turning down the invitation and Phoebe being asked and turning down the invitation. So we have these pairs of turns. One of them's funny and one of them isn't. And of course we can see, again, why it is that the audience are laughing at 11. We can see Phoebe doing a dispreferred action, so she's turning down an invitation. Um, it starts out looking like it's going to be a standard kind of way to turn down an invitation. Oh, I wish I could, and then an account, but then she doesn't give an account. She doesn't state that it's not that she can't come, she just doesn't want to come. Um, in this context here, we get the laughter. Um, so hopefully you can kind of see a sequential interest here. You can see a, a sequence being built, the pre-sequence establishing that Rachel is free, an invitation being issued, that is an action, and then the response to the action. Um, and in this kind of sitcom moment, we can see what's funny um, about someone turning an invitation down this way. Um, and the sitcoms are, are, are often built in, with these kinds of uh, trajectories. Okay, so this, I'm trying to show you this to see a kind of um, convers traditional conversation analytic interest in something. So I want you to contrast that now um, with another extract. This is also from Friends. Um, and here, this is, this is much further on in, in, I don't know, season nine or something, I don't know. Anyway, here we've got two of the characters, Chandler and Monica. They're preparing to get married. Um, Ross is Monica's sister. And Ross has got it into his head that he's going to play Scottish bagpipes at the wedding. And Chandler and Monica are very against this happening. They really don't want, as you all know, the excruciating sound of the Scottish bagpipes at their wedding. Um, and it's on the basis, okay, so, so Monica and Chandler have contrived a conversation that they're going to have in front of Ross to sort of say that Chandler hates all things Scottish. So hopefully Ross will pick this up and think, uh-oh, I'd better not do the bagpipe thing. Um, and so they can, they don't have to sort of tell him rudely, you know, we don't want you to play the bagpipes, that he can just pick it up. So. Okay, so forget for the moment the kind of conversation analytic interest that we might have in what's going on here. Um, and instead, think about the way this supposed aspect of Chandler's identity, him being half Scottish, is being made relevant to do something. Okay? And then think particularly about this extra lines that was, for some reason, edited out um, of the original script and not filmed, um, which is, we can perhaps see a fairly abrupt join between um, lines 8 and lines 13. But what was edited out of the original script was Monica saying, no, no, they're not, they're still very angry, but you know, Chandler is also half Swedish. You know what Swedish people are famous for? Sitting down and being quiet. And then they, the, the sequence that we have it filmed um, is reinstated. Okay, so what we can see here is the way various aspects of someone's identity, being half Scottish, being half Swedish, may be brought into a conversation to accomplish some bit of interaction or business. And particularly we can see how various aspects of what it means to be Swedish are also brought to bear for the moment, if you like. So let's forget whether Swedish people are objectively famous for sitting down and being quiet. That isn't really the point. The point is that identities can be invoked and various things can get attached to identities in a particular moment to do a particular thing. So, my question is, 
if you're interested in things like being a bit half Swedish and what it, what Swedish national stereotypes might be and, and you want to understand Swedishness or even Scottishness, how can you go about approaching a topic kind of issue like that and yet still maintain a kind of CA, ethnomethodological um, stance towards the data that you're collecting? How, how's that going to work? Okay, so that's the basic contrast that we're going to think about. Uh, and also pull, pull those two concerns together as we go through the talk. So I'm going to string together some quotes now about the differences between sequential and categorical or topical concerns. So here is a definition of CA from John Heritage. A focus on the normative structuring and logics or particular courses of social action and their organisation into systems through which participants manage turn-taking, repair and other systemic dimensions of interaction. Okay, so some, I've just highlighted some key words there. Things like structure, logic, systemic. Those kinds of robust sounding words that sound terribly technical and intense um, about CA. And here's a description of membership categorization analysis, which has an interest, well, we can think about what its a priori interest might be, but in terms of investigating things like identity topics, categories, and, and society, it sounds much more plausible. Membership categorization analysis, for those of you, again, who, who don't know, um, CA was born in, in, in Harvey Sachs' lectures, and so was membership categorization analysis. The two have had this kind of slightly tricky relationship, which I'll talk about. Um, so here is um, membership categorization analysis. So are we going to focus on normative structuring and logics, or are we going to focus on people's practices for describing and displaying an understanding of the world and society, examining the practices that display culture in action through the methodical application of social categories? from Fitzgerald et al. So this definition of the kinds of things one might pursue in interactional materials sounds quite different. I mean, I've chosen two quotes that, that polarise a bit anyway, deliberately. But still, the world, society, and category sounds a little bit different <coughs> from structure, logic, and systems. OK, so despite claims that categories are relevant for the doing of some activity, so in Sachs's original writings about Categories. He very much put categories and sequences together. Um, and despite the fact that both sequential and categorizational aspects of social interaction inform each other, according to Hester and Eglin, who are well-known writers on membership categorization, the two branches of Sachs's work have largely de developed in isolation from one another, um, according to Plunkett. And you can read many quotes like this that sort of take the two apart. CA is focusing on sequence and membership categorization analysis is in a wild and promiscuous way focusing on the world, category, society, and not really pinning anything down precisely enough. Um, and so, because of the uneasy relations between MCA and CA, an analysis that explicitly treats both categorization and sequential aspects of talk is hardly done, according to Hansen. Not this Hansen, but somebody else. So how can we go about systematically analysing the world? There are, there are kind of things that look like they are pushing against doing systematic analyses of the world, the categories in the world, the big topics. Um, how capturable would it be to, to go out and try and investigate being half Swedish? How would one ever do that? Um, we can in, collect, as we probably all know, loads of interaction material and look for the way well it works at the start of turns. Or we could look at gaps between turns. Or we could look at cause, you know, particular courses of action regardless of content, if you like, in, in some sort of way. But how on earth are you going to capture half Swedish? Um, and there are various um, people who would argue that you kind of can't do this kind of thing. So according to Van Dyke, for instance, we cannot simply go out into the field and observe how, when, where, and with whom people talk with others about identity groups. He was talking particularly about ethnicity. Finding data would account, amount to a search for the proverbial needle um, in the haystack. So in other words, let's say you're interested in half Swedish and you want to investigate it in some kind of natural environment. What are you going to do? Just record for hours on end random interactional sites on the off chance that someone might talk about being half Swedish? 
Um, no, what you're probably going to do is interview people and say, hey, what's it like to be half Swedish? And collect those data. And then you have the problem of those kind of surrogate materials where the life you're interested in about being half Swedish is happening somewhere over here, um, but you haven't got that captured. So over here, you then sort of say, what's it like about life over there? What's it like to be half Swedish? But you ask that in a research setting. OK, similar quote um, from conversation analysts. So, because we cannot know in advance when a person will explicitly invoke a category, there is no way to plan data collection of them. Collections in all likelihood would not be instances of the same interactional phenomenon. So again, even if you were to collect oodles and oodles, hours and hours of data, um, and for like five mentions of being half Swedish, which even it sounds implausible, it's very likely that they'd be, you know, want to be half Swedish in one setting, want to be half Swedish in doing another type of thing, and they wouldn't be the same thing anyway. So, so how are you going to um, do this? Thus, establishing the mechanisms by which a specific identity is made relevant and consequential in any particular episode of interaction has remained elusive. Okay. I think um, one kind of small irony um, about this argument against a systematic exploration of categories um, is that um, if we think about Chomskyan linguistics, which I, you will all know far more than I, than, about than I do, but if you think about the competence performance distinction and the idea that real talk is too messy to study, and then we have CA showing the orderliness of, of, of everyday talk, um, here we have a similar kind of argument, which is, well, we can, we can look at structural, sequential matters in, in real talk, but we can't possibly bring order to categories because they're just too messy. Um, so I think it's a kind of nice comparison to think about, well, the challenge is then, how are we going to be able to say systematic things about things like being half Swedish? Um, I'm not going to look at half Swedish <laughs> as my category. Um, I'm going to take us through some gender categories because gender has been um, my interest. Um, and what I'm going to do is take us through, I think, three analytic sections in which I'm hopefully going to show you how it is that you can find the same categories being tied to the same kind of categorical attributes or um, characteristics um, in the same sorts of action-oriented environments. Um, and obviously now um, presenting this, date, this, this talk, I have a nice story. The narrative kind of runs in this linear way. Um, but of course, real research doesn't work that way. Um, so it, what I started out with was an interest in gender. Um, and I was interested in how gender could be made relevant to interaction in ways that I could study as a feminist without recourse to, well, I know that's a man and I know that's a woman and therefore he's talking that way and he's dominating because he's a man and, and or women talk like this, men talk like that. And having that kind of sociolinguistic interest, it didn't seem very satisfying or doing really much more than perpetuating stereotypes about men and women. Um, so when I was um, doing my PhD, I started to get interested in how do people, how, when, when do gender categories crop up in interaction? And also a kind of a, 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 a feeling that if gender is so damned important and all around us, then I ought to be able to find it everywhere. Um, so how am I going to find it? Um, and so my tutorial data was my first data collection, and then since then over the years I've collected loads of different data, and just started to build collections of there's another there's another mention of gender category, and there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and um, once you've got enough material, you can then start to see how they're bunching together uh, in certain sorts of ways. So the first collection that I'm going to show you. Um, are all from different interactional contexts, um, but the topic is the same in each context, and it's about um, men, women and men's dating behaviour, particularly their sort of early dating behaviour. Um, and broadly speaking, what we have here is friends giving advice to one another um, about what to do when he or she doesn't call. Okay, so we all know that about, right? Okay, so the first extract. Um, before we get to some real data is another one from friends. Um, what's kind of nice about this is that we can, again, see the recognizable recognizability of scenarios, of categories, because we're going to jump from friends to real materials, and you know, you're, you're hardly going to see the join. Um, so, okay, here we have, um, this is again from the very first episode uh, in Friends, and Chandler is talking about having a really brilliant first date. 
Um, and then they're going to talk about whether or not he should call back this woman. And he's going to say, well, I'm not going to call her back. I'm going to look really neat. Okay, the key word there is, is, is slightly hidden by the little one. But she says testosterone here. If you can hear that, it's suddenly gone quiet. Um, okay, so what we have here, just very briefly, um, is Chandler recounting this date, um, Monica asking about the call, and then the, 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 the initial laughter is um, the contrast between um, Chandler's description of this date as being very natural, no game playing, and then straight into I'm, gonna, I'm not going to call her, I'm going to play games. Um, but my interest is in particularly the way categories, um, guys I know can be a generic, but we can maybe talk about that later, um, but testosterone. So we have category resonant descriptions here. Um, and being tied to particular sorts of activities. So being a guy or being testosterone, um, being one of um, you people, which is sort of specified a bit further by Phoebe in the final turn about we're talk, you know, when we talk about you people, we can see the partitioning between the participants, between the female participants and the male participants. Um, and we have them in situ caught, tying what it means to be a male to um, particular sorts of activities around not calling, um, not letting women know you like them, letting women dangle, not seeming needy. Okay, so again, these are all very familiar. I mean, the cult, you know, the, the kind of the, the script writers are displaying some kind of cultural knowledge here. Otherwise, the whole script wouldn't work. So that's kind of nice. Um, but we're going to see a similar kind of thing now um, in another extract, um, and this is um, a recording of a conversation between two students in the UK. Um, and they're chatting as they get ready to go out for the night. So here you've got E and S. There's some people in the background that we can't really hear. Um, and E is talking about um, whether or not uh, her sort of newish boyfriend has been texting her or back or not and, and how long um, she should wait and also how she should interpret his sort of not very speedy uh, response to her texts. Is it text that we have to do? No. I really don't know, actually, really. I'm not sure whether it's just being on the man and so casual, which they are, or whether it's a kind of... Hey, can you go up there and back to the bed? Can you pick all the rest and try to get to it? No. Okay, so despite the first extract that we saw being scripted dialogue, um, and extract two being kind of real interaction nearly 20 years later, um, we can see the gender dating theme being articulated in a similar kind of way. And we can see that we're again in the kind of zone of advice giving where S is going to sort of give advice to E um, and help her figure out the situation that she's in. Um, and again, we can see various category um, and um, categorical kind of things, things getting attached to categories in, in situ. So here, what it means to be a man is to be a bastard or to be casual. Um, so different words, but the same kind of resonance, the same kinds of ballpark we're in um, as the previous extract. OK, so let's just think a little bit about what it can do to, um, for, for kind of your self-presentation and maybe um, your, your sanity as well in some ways. Um, to go categorical in these advice sorts of sequences. Um, so one thing that you can do if you're thinking about your partner's behavior, here's some dating tips here, folks. Um, if you're thinking about your partner's behavior and you think, you know, how, how am I going to interpret this lack of texting? If you, if you think, well, they're just being a typical bloke, then it's nothing that you've done. Okay? So it's, it's a nice sort of affiliative thing to do between friends as well to say, you're not doing anything wrong. Um, it's just that the person that you're having to deal with, and this could be all mothers of this or all fathers of that, you know, it could, the category can change, but what people are doing here by kind of going categorical in these advice sequences, by placing the person who is the troubling person for the, for the person being, you know, the, the recipient, um, is to kind of say, well, it's not me. Um, it's just that this person that I'm interacting with, they're in this category, members of this category will always inevitably act like this, and therefore um, it's nothing that I have done. I can't change my own behavior. I'm not culpable. Um, and we can see how this particular thing around lack of personal culpability and the behavior of members of categories works in, more, in settings of, well, I don't know whether being in a police interrogation is more consequential than one's love life, but 
Um, anyway, we're going to get to see this in a different sort of setting. Um, and then finally, um, not, well, not quite finally, here is um, some text-based material, some online material. This is an internet community forum in which forum members post and respond to problems of various kinds. And we can see similarly um, problem formulation in which you have a description of certain sorts of activities. And again, I'm hoping that you can see a connection now between these abstracts. Suddenly going cold, giving one word answers, no, te no kisses as in before. Um, and the kind of advice given by the next poster is, um, you know what men are like, you know, prescribing some kind of action, but also it's not you, it's what men are like. Okay. And then finally, um, in this extract, in this, in this section, um, this is a bunch of students sitting on a sofa, not unlike the manky sofa in, in, in Friends, just to tie the whole thing up together, um, and they're sitting watching the television. Um, so three students, they're watching the television, and the person that is, there's, there's going to be a man in the sequence, but you don't see him, he's off, he's off camera. And here again, um, they're in the same zone, talking about how fast one should respond to text messages and so on, except that this time, um, these three women are collaboratively pursuing one course of action that they are recommending to their male friend, which is basically um, the kind of opposite to what we saw in the friend's transcript right at the start. So here we have the women recommending game playing and the man saying, no, 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 I'm a man and I don't game play. And that brings, leads to some clarity mm -hmm. in the extract. So. No, don't pass me the Action in early dating. Um, the, the women friends here are sort of collaboratively one of sort of party to this interaction where they're all uh, recommending uh, the same course of action, which is that G slows down the pace of response to his girlfriend. Um, and again, um, we can see various um, activities that we're kind of familiar with. Um, not texting back, playing games, who's playing games, etc. Being tied um, to various categories. But what's nice about this um, particular extract is how we can see the lack of inevitability about gender, uh, being a man, being a woman, and what that means in gender da dating behavior. Because at least here, we can see how the male participant is sort of taking himself out of that idea of being a game player and, if, and, and sort of linking being a male um, as, as a category with being hard and straight. So although he's describing himself, he's describing a particular strategy of being hard and straight and not game playing to the category a male. Okay. So in terms of understanding categories, we can see a, a whole bunch, and I have more of these, where you have a general activity happening, advice giving, a general topic being discussed, dating, um, and various sorts of activities being tied to categories in situ. And although, again, we don't have exactly the same wording in each extract, I hope that you can sort of see the resonances and the links between the extracts that I've shown you in which certain sorts of behaviours get linked to gender categories, but also how they may be resisted, um, even though um, they're kind of laughed out of all possibility that a man would be hard and straight. Um, and um, not play games. Okay, the next section um, is um, looking more specifically at um, things that co-occur with um, gender categories, and you've already seen a little bit uh, of this in the uh, online data. So in this section, we're going to look at, at account giving. So we're not particularly looking at advice per se, we're looking at accounts. Um, and we're going to focus on the way, again, particular activities get tied to categories, but also how they coalesce um, with a common knowledge component. So that's, in other words, an appeal to intersubjectivity. Um, 
And again, once I began sort of noticing this particular um, sort of anatomical way in which a categorial practice is put together, I started to notice them everywhere. Um, again, although I'm using gender categories as my example, um, any category would kind of do. But the point is that you can see, again, systematic things um, about categories. So here we have the first extract, um, which is um, a pharmacist talking on the radio, uh, describing the over-the-counter prescription of Viagra. Okay? And she's answering a question about the kinds of people that come to get over-the-counter Viagra. All the women, when we talked to them, said, I've been waiting to do something about this for ages, and I've just never gotten out of it. Typical guy response, really, you know. And eventually, they think, well, I really do need to do something about it now. Okay. So, I want you to notice three components of this, in this extract, three component features in this account as to why it is that men might not always readily go to the doctors. And again, this is terribly familiar to us. And I think one thing that you'll notice, or if you haven't noticed already, and as we go through is, the almost idiomatic way in which these kinds of gender categories and things that get tied to them in a particular situation, they're so familiar to us. Um, and in a way, that's kind of how they work. But also, they're built to work in that way. So, so, okay. so I just want you to notice for now, um, we have this thing, typical guy response, really, you know. So we have a description uh, of, a, of an individual situation um, I've just been meaning to do that, something about this for ages, I've never got around to it. We have that kind of individualized behavior being tied to a, what a, a man might typically do. And then this, you know. Okay. Um, the next extract that I'm going to show you, just to put two together, um, comes from a telephone call into um, what is called in the UK the antisocial behavior um, area of the local council. Do you, have you heard of ASBOs? Um, I don't know if it, it, it was a very controversial thing in the UK. It's just been phased out inexplicably, actually, by the, by the white women party. It's a scandal they love. Um, but it's the kind of thing that you can do, which is if there are a bunch of kids hanging around outside with their hoods up, um, they can be given an ASBO, which meant that they, um, they're not allowed to hang around together and they're not allowed to have their hoods up, things like that. And, and if they breach their ASBO, they can be arrested. You can see why this wasn't a popular kind of thing. Um, Anyway, here we have a caller. She's phoning up the ASBO officer who's going to decide whether or not to kind of make a case towards someone who's behaving in a dodgy kind of way, apparently. Um, and here she is accounting for why it is that she's got a long-standing dispute with her neighbour. So I'll let her tell you why it is that she's got a problem with this male neighbour. It's because I won't speak to him, you see. It all goes back five years. He offered me a lift and I wasn't going. You know, I mean, I didn't for that. Okay. Well. So... Um, what we have in, in both of these extracts, to think about them together, is a description of an individual person, an individual sort of set of behaviours. Um, I've been to do this for ages, the kind of the typical guy response from the doctor, and then it's because I would speak to him, he say, it all goes back, he offered me a lift and I wouldn't go in. So here, um, a spurned man, you know how it is, you're walking down the street, the, bu the builders initially are like, woo -hoo, we love, and then if you do something that's not very friendly in response, then you're instantly bitch. Um, so the kind of, um, yeah, recognizable scenario. So we have description, being treated as a categorical thing, so being categorized, being seen as not just a one-off thing, but as being something typical of, of the category in general, and then a common knowledge component. And here we have the you know and you know in both places. Um, and one interesting thing about um, these um, sort of categorical groupings, in fact, these coalescing features, is the way they propose the thing that is being discussed as shared common knowledge in, in common between the two speakers. Um, in the first extract, we don't get a ratifying response from the interviewer on the radio. Um, we can perhaps account for that because it's radio and we don't tend to get responses to things in, by, by interview, interviewers. Um, and in the second one, we get an mm. um, So it's not, the A doesn't say, yes, I know how men are, I've had that experience too, or anything like that. She doesn't go that far affiliating with the caller. But what neither does she say, huh? Um, and I don't have instances, I'm not sure they exist, but I don't have instances where people go, huh? No, I don't know how men are, even though you can imagine people doing that. And, um, so 
the interesting thing about this is this quote from Baker, whose name has been chopped off the bottom of my slide, but, but for the people in the video, um, this is Carolyn Baker. Um, the artful production of plausible versions using recognizable membership categorization devices is a profoundly important form of cultural competence. So what we can see here is not just culturally competent members recognizing each other's descriptions of categories and uh, category members, and what is typical of category members, but that speakers kind of put them out there as something that you will share. Um, so you know, you know how men are. Mm. They don't get. Mm. No, I don't. It's it, it it's it's a kind of shortcutting and packaging device. We need not say more. And I suppose what's interesting, um, let's think particularly about the second one, is there is some shared cultural knowledge here that is foundational to the progress of the sequence. What is this shared knowledge? Um, it's something like I said to you at the start. It's something like you know. Men make the first move in a dating encounter or a potentially romantic encounter. Um, uh, women are then the gatekeepers of that encounter and they say yes or no and the, and the encounter will build. Um, or, or just something along those lines. And the whole point is it's something along those lines. It's kind of recognizable, but it's not specified. And when we package these descriptions and shortcut them to a category, we're proposing that you know enough about this category member for us to carry on. Um, and so we can kind of see shared cultural knowledge that they have enough of. They don't need to go any more down the line of what men are like for them to recognize this as something on which to build a course of action. OK, so here's three more. Uh, and the next ones, these are all from police interrogations. Um, and in the first one, the suspect is accounting for why um, the woman that he's been arrested for harassing um, might have perhaps mis misinterpreted um, his behavior as harassment. He's a downstairs neighbor. They used to be partners. He's using the fact that they are neighbors to always open a door, make sort of communicative noises through the ceiling to try and attract her attention. And his account is, I'm just being a neighbor. Her account is, it's harassment. Um, and here the police officer has asked her, you know, um, what do you think her reaction is going to be to the fact that you're always knocking on the door and kind of trying to communicate through the ceiling? <laughs>
Um, and then this um, final extract, very unusual, where the suspect is describing her own circumstances, which is treated as categorial by the police officer. Um, and notice that he says, a girlfriend. He could say, my girlfriend's like that, but he interprets or sort of ties her descriptions of her behavior to what is typical of girlfriends in general. Um, and it's quite interesting the way this one then unfolds because the suspect is probably not expecting anything like this from a police officer and it's kind of causes a bit of a stumble in the progress of the sequence. Um, okay. So the first section that we saw was topical and action tied to advice giving. The section that we've just seen, um, we've seen a kind of practice and you'll start to recognize them and see them everywhere. You have a description of something individual circumstance being tied or seen as categorical by the, by the speaker themselves or by a recipient um, and proffered as uh, or treated as common knowledge, no need to further unpack and almost idiomatic. So what I'm hoping that you can start to see here is how categorical phenomenon, the world, um, can start to fall out into patterns one, more readily than one might intuit before looking. Um, the next section, which is the third section, um, when and we're kind of getting to the end of this bit of the talk now, um, takes a kind of bog standard conversation analysis topic, the question answer sequence, um, and focuses specifically, again, on how the world is generated through a question answer sequence. And what we're going to look at is the way people in response to questions can go, ca go categorical in their answers. So, Starting with um, the question that initiated the pharmacist's account of who goes for Viagra. Okay. What sort of people have been coming to you? We've had a wide variety of gentlemen coming to see us to access the Viagra through our program. Okay, now in CA terms, first of all, we have a WH question, the first pair part of the question answer sequence which makes relevant a categorical response. What kind, what, sorry, what sort of people? And you get the, a what sort of people responded to in the answer. Okay, here's another one. This is, um, sorry, so we have a, a type conforming second pair part uh, answer. <coughs> the next one is from a speed date. Um, this is uh, a man, sorry, no, a woman asking a man um, why Leicester? And he's been talking about that he moved to a, uh, this town in the UK called Leicester. And she's saying, why Leicester then? Why did you move to Leicester? Why Leicester then? Why Leicester then? I followed a woman. Okay, so here again we have a WH question, making relevant an account. Um, and here we have a type conforming answer, so we get an account, but we get a categorical account. Um, so one thing you can pursue in a very sort of CA, box standard way is, when is it that people go categorical in answers? to questions. So here are, um, again, some police data in which suspects are going to give type conforming <coughs> responses and then expand the sequence by giving a category based account. And each of the extracts that I'm going to show you um, is a police officer asking a suspect who's admitted some level probably of, of assault um, or, or, or something. They're in that kind of situation, um, more specific details about did you threaten them? Did you assault them? And so on. So. Okay. So here we have. Okay. Sorry, I got my next extract to show you too. So here's another one. Same sort of thing. Do you think your husband hit her? No, my husband would never hit a woman. So in both examples, we have a question, a yes-no interrogative about a specific person or incident, followed by a type-conforming answer, a no and a no, and then an account, which is a category-based denial. So in both of these, and again, I have a bunch of these and an article that you can read if you want to read the rest of them, um, in which the suspects go categorical in their account. I've never written a woman in my life, and I never written will it a woman in my, ma my life. The second one, the suspect is a female suspect. She's been accused of assault of another woman. She's denying the assault, and so the police officer is saying, well, she's got these injuries. How do you account for them? Did you, maybe it was your husband. No, my husband would never hit a woman. So first of all, we can see here, um, and this is, again, the name here is, is Edwards. 
um, how the modal verb would is used by suspects to claim a disposition to act in ways inconsistent with whatever offence they are accused of, its value being in the way that its semantics provide for a sense of backdated predictability with regard to the actions in question. So in other words, because I'm the kind of person who would never in general do this behaviour, which is hit a woman, then I didn't do it in this specific situation. A category based on mile. I'm the kind of person who, claiming a disposition which kind of predates and backdates anything that I might now be being asked about. Um, and we can also see, again, a, a kind of familiar, culturally familiar, usable thing here, which is being the kind of man who does or doesn't hit women. And we can see this kind of some kind of hierarchical arrangements between categories in, in these extracts and in others, in which who is it that you're going to admit to hitting? Um, you will admit to hitting somebody who you see as an equivalent category member in terms of status. But you will deny, and it's important to deny and to make sure you're the kind of person who doesn't hit kids as an adult or hit the elderly as a, a younger person uh, or hit women if you're a man. But men, as we'll see in a minute, will admit hitting other men um, much more readily, if you like, than they will admit hitting women. And this is the account. So we're getting again at the world and society here in which um, that men may hit women is proffered as this kind of category bound activity. Um, but we can see suspects in various guises denying membership or denying on behalf of somebody else uh, be, being the kind of man who hits a woman or being married to the kind of man who hits a woman, taking up a moral stance against those who do. So here's another one. This is a slightly longer account. Uh, a longer extract, rather. Chamber of Fools after the ground. Mm -hmm. So I was going to uh, come down now to keep her eyes on her eyes and go on that. And we both see this raise in the church, but I'll go on. But we need not to keep her eyes, you might say. We need to do that. We need to do that. We need to do that. We need to do Okay, so here the suspect has admitted assaulting. Uh, the male member of a couple, a married couple, um, but he's denying uh, assaulting the woman. So we've had we've had various questions about about that, and here the police officer is again asking a, a yes/no interrogative about a specific person or event, um, a type-conforming response, uh, and then an account um, in which we can see again a category-based denial. Um, what's particularly nice um, about this one is that. At lines 10 to 11, the suspect builds this, this idea that we have about being the kind of person to not hit a woman, being the kind of man to not hit a woman, um, as a kind of sayable thing, but the ways, generalizing, not to kick a woman, again, any woman, I'm the kind of person who wouldn't ever do that, as you might say. So as you might say, tells us, if you like, this is a sayable thing out there, this is a usable, pull downable thing to be used in, um, in this extra, in, in, in this particular um, scenario. Okay, so the next one we can see this whole thing being subverted. So here is a, um, a suspect who's admitted hitting his wife with a bottle. <laughs> okay, so here we have uh, a question, a WH question. We have a type conforming answer, and then we have a category based admission. But of course, here we have a modification of the category because this is not the vulnerable, hittable type of woman that one must deny hitting. <coughs> this is a woman who is more like a man with bollocks down there. And therefore, you can admit to hitting or, or throwing a bottle at this particular woman and maintain one's moral stance as the kind of man who doesn't hit women because this isn't that kind of woman. This is a woman who is more like a man and therefore, you know, equal. Um, he's a right feminist, this one. <laughs> okay, so um, I hope you've seen um, the way in which you can collect and start to group together certain sorts of categorial um, topics and interest and interaction and study them um, systematically. So bringing together the systematic uh, analysis of CA with a kind of interest in, in categories in the world. Um, I'm going to finish now with my final um, section, which was, and like I said, this isn't a particularly neat segue, but um, it's kind of what I'm doing partly over here um, in the States. 
which is the third question about, okay, we're all doing this kind of detailed interactional analysis. How can we apply our close findings of, the, of these sorts um, in a world in which impact and usefulness um, is important? And so I'm just going to talk to you very briefly for five minutes before we finish um, about the conversationality role play method, which I invented. Um, because I thought I need an acronym. And CALM, because I'm doing it mostly with mediators, I thought CALM, that will appeal to mediators. And it turns out it really does. So um, <clears throat> this is what I've been um, doing recently. And I'm here uh, in the US. I've been to uh, Washington to the Superior Court Alternative Dispute Resolution Service. And I'm talking to mediators at John Jay here and then <clears throat> in Boston um, next week. So this project that I've been doing, basically, you can see so far that I, I didn't give you a handout. Um, today deliberately, because one of the things that you can um, do when you're presenting interactional material is not let people know what happens next. Um, and it's a way of like you all looking at the screen and not looking at me. It's also a way, of course, that you can't really inspect the data too closely because I'm not giving it to you. Um, but mostly, it is a way of presenting material so that you don't jump ahead and get the punchline. Okay, and quite a lot of the data that you've seen today, I kind of didn't want you to know um, the punchline. And so one thing that I've been doing is using this way of presenting interactional material to train um, neighbor dispute mediators, alternative dispute people, um, because I've done a lot of work um, over the past few years on neighbor disputes. And the antisocial behavior stuff that you've seen and the police data that you've seen were part of the data that I collected for this project in which I recorded telephone calls into neighbor mediation services, into the local council, um, and also when things got really, you know, fisticuffs between neighbours and things got damaged or people got hit, then neighbours would be arrested and they might be interviewed at a police station and the police um, record those interactions as well. And so what I've been doing mostly with mediators is going back, taking findings that I think are going to be interesting to them and presenting line by line bits of data um, and then getting them to role play with real materials, which is such a contrast to the kind of simulated interaction that role play is, is always taking, um, to, to sort of figure out um, what you might do as a mediator in response to a real scenario that's happening and unfolding. Um, and then I'll show them what an actual mediator did in response to the particular problem. Um, and then they will evaluate that. And basically what they do is say, well, we would never do that and we'd do it much better. And that's what they all say. Um, but anyway, that, but you can see the appeal and, and the way this would work. So I just want to show you um, briefly um, a couple of things, kinds of things that I've, I've done with mediators um, before we finish. So um, this is um, a very typical call into the start of, at the start of a call into a mediation center. Um, and I got interested in this because it is a place where identity matters become relevant in terms of who is speaking and also whether or not the caller knows the, the place, the place that they're, they're phoning. So I'm going to play you the extract and say a couple of things about it that, were re that are relevant to mediators and why they're interested in this stuff. <laughs> And so people will tell you in the start of the call, I have just called somebody else, um, and I didn't know to call mediation, despite the fact that I've got really terrible neighbors. Um, and so the mediator is always in this position of being someone that the caller doesn't know, and they don't know what to expect. And this leads to all sorts of trouble in the interaction. And calls almost always start like this, where the caller will tell you where they've just phoned or that they didn't know to call you. And so this leads to terrible kind of crashes um, in the interaction. Um, and then, so I, one thing I get the call, the, the, the participants in the workshop to do is say, well, okay, what would you do next? Um, and then they have all sorts of answers, and then I show them what the mediator actually did next. And, and then they evaluate it. But we start 
through lots of examples of, of very early moments in the interaction between the mediator and the caller, where basically you can often find clues as to why this call is going to go wrong right at the start of the call, and also how important it is that to get these initial calls right, because in, in the UK at least, if you don't get a call, a, a caller at the end of the interaction saying, I'm going to become a client of the mediation service, then the mediation centre won't be able to have that person in their statistics to justify their existence, to justify their funding, and they're already very precariously funded as it is. So you have this very vicious circle where the mediation centres don't really think that these initial calls are going to be very important, but in fact they're crucial, because if you don't get the kind of yes at the end of one of these calls, um, then you're losing clients and mediation centres need clients. But what's working against them is that the callers don't know who the mediators are, they don't know what to expect, and they find the whole neutral, impartial stance of the mediators very important. So a couple more extracts to give you an example again of the kind of thing. So here um, is a caller um, giving a kind of classic reason as to why she doesn't really want to go ahead with mediation. What happens is we just come to see you and then find out what you would like to happen. And if you, if you decide that mediation is worth trying, we'll then contact your neighbours to offer them a similar appointment and hear what's happening from their point of view. Okay, so here we've got the mediator doing what they will have to do at some point in the interaction, which is to explain what mediation is. Um, and then you get the caller starting to say no, basically. And one of the reasons why callers start to say no to uh, the offer of mediation is that they don't want their neighbour to know that they have instigated a complaint against them. And you get all sorts of variations on this, so they fear reprisals, they don't want it to escalate. What they often want is to talk to somebody, <clears throat> but the mediator is kind of hell-bent on getting this person to become a client. But in the process of doing that, they will often be very off-putting. Um, so this is um, a, an example where it starts to become that the caller is going to say no to the offer of mediation on the basis that they don't want their neighbour to know that they've instigated a complaint. Now here's another example, and again, so I get, you know, we, we sort of work our way through this extract and then I, we, we see a contrast, um, a sort of magical mediation moment, something that the mediators can think, ah, okay, so when I'm explaining the mediation process, I need to do it in a way that is as encouraging as possible and not as off-putting as possible. And here is one little, and, and this is where the tiny detail that we're all so fascinated by, but you know, the, the people out there are like, oh, um, comes into its own. So watch for this, you'll spot it. I think I need to put it in red in case you didn't, but you'll spot it anyway, and it's one of those beautiful moments. We try to help neighbours that are in dispute. Mm -hmm. What we do first, um, send a letter out to your neighbour straight away to say that we've been in touch with you. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. So. <laughs> It's one of those things that, A, if you weren't a CA person and you were transcribing it out, you wouldn't get it. You would tidy it up or you just wouldn't notice it at all because you're not tuned into it. Um, so it's one of those tiny details, but also it, it shows us the mediator's orientation to what it is that she's doing. So the mediator was about to, in her description of mediation, was about to say, probably, we send a letter out to your neighbour straight away to say that you've been in touch with us. But we, we know and she knows that probably that's not what the caller wants. So she does a quick repair, We've been in touch with you, okay, and that's really nice in terms of make, you know helping the caller not see that I am instigating something and perhaps you know less readily. This isn't behaviorism; it's not cause and effect, but at least less readily perhaps coming back to the issue of won't they know that I've been complaining because the mediator will say we've been in touch with you. Um, when I show this and we work through these, then um, in, in in the calm workshops. Um, it, 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 you, they debate for hours about whether this is lying, it's disingenuous, they shouldn't be doing it, or, or whether in the end they need the clients, they need bums on seats, it's the bottom line. We, you know, and we don't want to be putting people off because we need people into our organisation. Okay, and um, finally, here is um, again another um, magical mediation moment in which the caller, uh, the mediator is again, it's this, it's this same call, she's been explaining the process, she's putting the offer directly, you know, do you think this is going to be helpful to you? And you're going to see um, what the caller does with that. Does that sound like it might be helpful to you? Uh, uh, it might be, but um, I'm not too sure at this stage about you know how long seeing this girl yeah. at all. 
Okay, so we're now right back at the start of my lecture on turning down, you know, turning things down in, in the polite kind of way. So we have the Rachel unfunny way of turning something down. We have an offer. Um, uh, it might be, but um, we all know where that's going. That's going in the direction of a no. So again, to the mediators, I say, what are you going to do to rescue this situation? Is it rescuable? How are you going to get this person to say yes to mediation? Um, and what's really nice about what happens next is that none of the mediators uh, guess it, which tells you something about the authenticity of simulation, which is what they will use to train. And it's my current kind of book there, which I'm going to knock it over. I'm, look, I'm looking at simulated versus the real thing to look at, okay, how similar are they? Because everyone just assumes they are. We all know, you know, the CA people amongst us all particularly know that people say, why are you studying talk? We all know how that works. What's the point? Um, despite the fact that I have many extracts like this, in which mediators do exactly the kind of thing that you're going to now see a mediator do, they can't intuit it. And yet they're doing it. And that just shows you how this kind of training where you're seeing the real thing unfolding is so valuable. So this is what the mediator does next. And again, think about the difference between we have the kind of reject, Im, rejection implicative um, turn at lines three to four. The mediator's going to do something and then you're going to see an incredibly enthusiastic uptake from the caller. Do you want to write down yourself what you think it's going to be? <laughs> Yeah, but you'd be willing to say two of our mediators oh, just course, to talk yeah, about it all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, all right, my love. Um, when's the best time for you to be in? Okay, so here we have um, the caller, sorry, the mediator, switching from an interrogative question doing an offer to um, a declarative, formulated characterological, dispositional, moral. This caller has spent some time saying what a nice person I am and what a complete shit my neighbor is. So I'm gonna, the mediator's gonna use it. You're the kind of person who would be willing to. You can't really say no to that without looking like a complete moron. So you'd be willing to see two of our mediators just to talk about it. So now, and you can see how far into the turn um, the caller's coming in. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, a very, very strong uptake to the offer, and then they move into arrangements. So now we have this moment in which the caller has been converted into a client of the mediation service, and it just works. You know, it, again, it's not behaviorism, it's not cause and effect, but in terms of strategies that mediators can use, then the declarative formatted moral dispositional kind of characterological formulation of the caller uh, way of putting an offer um, can work. So, to summarize, Okay, no, I've got all more extract. Um, I'll just, I'll, okay, uh, so th this is very quick. This is um, a specific workshop that I ran with uh, mediators. They wanted a, a whole session on how to deal with racist callers. So I'm just going to show you the extract just to give you a way, a, a way of seeing how it works through very slowly, but I won't say anything about it because we're running out of time. Thank you, Um, it's Okay, so they spend some time on, is this a racist caller? If not, why not? If yes, why? So that takes ages. And then what you're going to do next is the mediator. And then I show them what happens next, which is nothing. And then... I'm no problem with engines, but unfortunately it's all gas, there isn't any work. Okay, so now what you're going to do is the mediator? Um, nothing. And so what happens next? That's not racist. Okay. <laughs> um, and so then, we're look, then we get into things like, and they're very, very, even without knowing the technical transcript, um, they start to read and understand why it is that four C's in a row and these numbers, which look so tiny that they can't possibly be important, actually become really important. And they start to understand that if this was a transcript um, transcribed out just as a kind of basic transcript, all of this would run together. You wouldn't see the fact that there were places in which a mediator could be doing something. And this gets into the whole issue of impartiality. Because what mediators will often do are aligning responses, continuous, um, and nothing affiliative, okay? And, and so they have reasons for doing no, nothing affiliative, but nevertheless doing aligning responses at points at which a response becomes relevant. Um, so then we're into the issue of, okay, if you're not gonna do aligning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, then what, are you, then what are you doing? You're doing disaffiliation. So you're, you're, you're not being impartial anymore, and yet you're meant to be impartial, but you're now taking a stance against this caller, and they know it. Um, and they're, deny they're denying your silent accusation uh, that happens at, at three and five and eight. So then this is what happens next. Well, I'm just wondering why the problem is, uh, some years ago, I mean, it's only since 1990. 
Okay. So I have a variety of contrasting extracts in which mediators have different strategies for dealing with this. This is the kind of, you know, make it explicit, name it, and challenge it um, approach, which didn't really probably get heard by the call in any way. And, you can, and again, then they start to see, you know, oh, those brackets again, those overlapping things, it's, it's you know, people aren't, it's not smooth anymore. Um, versus a kind of um, reformulating delete the noxious bit that we don't want to have to deal with um, tends to be the two strategies. And they, but they kind of then come up with this themselves based in real materials that you can kind of confront and this is what might happen if you confront, this is what happens if you, it happens if you might kind of delete the bit we don't want to deal with. Okay, and now this really is my final slide. Um, so, I asked first of all, what sorts of interactional phenomenon we can investigate systematically. Um, and we all know about sequential phenomena and the robust ways in which conversation analysts have shown us order uh, in interaction, but also hopefully the world um, in terms of some order to the way people put categories and resonant descriptions together in particular action-oriented environments, dating practices, gender and violence, and so on. We asked what issues are raised by focusing on sequential and or categorical or topic-based concerns. And again, what I hope to have shown you is the way order can be found in the mess of the world. Um, that categorical phenomena do prop up. Once you've, once you've got enough materials, you can start to see the same sorts of categories cropping up in the same sorts of categorical formulations, uh, in the same sorts of um, uh, environments doing the same sorts of action. Um, and the paper that I'm presenting today is mostly coming out in discourse that this is going to be a special issue with responses, which I'm terrified about. Um, I haven't seen the responses yet um, to, to this kind of argument. Um, and then finally, how can we apply findings from close empirical analyses um, in a world in which impact and usefulness matters? Um, and in something that I've written for um, my colleague at Loughborough's Charles Antarkey's book on application CA, um, I talk a bit about um, the way this kind of method maybe has its compromises, but the beauty of doing applied work um, to practitioners using conversation analysis and an ethnomethodological sort of spirit is that you're not trying to intervene in something that is different from the very practice that you're showing your participants themselves. So although um, we have, as, as conversation analysts, a kind of we're pushing against that we all know how talk works, we don't need CA people to tell us we all talk all the time. Um, it, it turns out that you know we are still studying things in a very close way. We're not taking big leaps, theorizing up, um, but neither do we need to particularly dumb down um, for the people who uh, we're trying to sort of help out um, in shaping their practices. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it was <laughs> I should, I should ask um, if I don't want questions. I don't know if you know um, the John Heritage stuff on Sum and Any. Do you know, do you know that work? Um, so John Heritage, who I quoted earlier describing conversation analysis, um, looked at did, did this kind of intervention in doctor-patient interrogation, uh, interrogation, doctor-patient interaction <laughs> involving interrogation, um, and looking at the issue of unmet concerns. So the way we go to a doctor, we have more than one problem that we want to deal with at the doctor. And, um, but we tend to leave having only discussed one thing. Um, and so he did this intervention where he got doctors after the initial problem presentation to say to a patient, and is there anything else you'd like to talk to me about today? Versus, and is there something else you'd like to talk to me about today? And it turns out that any gets a no and some gets a yes. Um, so I am now realizing that the whole time in my lectures, I say to students, any questions? Because <laughs> no, they're gonna say no. <laughs> so I'm now deliberately trying to say some questions. <laughs> but I think it might work well with cake. You know, you like you've got a cake left, one slice, you do dinner party. Any more cake? <laughs> Some more cake? <laughs> but I think what's nice about that study and similar sorts of work is the power of, you know, the power of one type of way of asking a question versus another and showing how conversation analysis without its, you know, it, it, it's, its accusations of being, you know, not being able to deal with the world, not being able to show anything about interesting things important stuff in the world can nevertheless actually intervene in, in useful words or sort of ways. So, some questions? Yeah. One thing I was sort of interested in is the fact that you're saying that you're bringing this to the United States. 
Yeah. And that you began using it in England. And I was wondering, or British, the United Kingdom, however you might have those guys. But um, have you noticed so far any differences between, I guess, you know, the British audience and the American audience and how they receive it, and also in the data for the British audience and the American audiences? Like, are these patterns universal across British English and American English? Or are there any slight differences? Like, would you notice different things that the mediators do in England, for instance, versus a similar thing in the United States? Um, I, I was quite scared about bringing my, 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 my the workshop that I've run, sort of many, the sort of initial workshop I've run many times now um, in the UK, and I did wonder very, a lot about how is this going to go down uh, to a bunch of US mediators, um, and it was surprisingly similar in terms of the way they responded to the extract. I did have to explain what big Barney meant, which means big argument, um, but apart from that, um, everything seemed to work quite well. Um, and in the same, I mean, it, it was even easier for the mediators in the uh, in the American workshop to say, well, we would never do it like that. Um, but that, you know, because um, and they could just say, because we're American and we do it better or whatever. And it was easier for me to go along with that. But basically, I I always find that in every single workshop, the participants will always say, well, we would never do it that way because I pay them some quite painful stuff. You know, mediators doing, you know, what they think is as dreadful things. Um, but no, surprisingly and, and gratifyingly similar, because yeah, I did think this might just might completely miss um, the mark. But so far, touch wood, so good. With regards to the earlier data, I mean, I don't know most of the data that you've seen there are British, so I haven't, yeah, I guess that's what I've got. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's filling, you need Did you start with all the data and then say, wow, this could be useful to people? And then how did you get in to those communities? Okay. You know, how did you get people to say, yeah, this actually could be useful? And yeah. then when you present it, how much of a description do you give of what CA is and what a transcript looks like? And, you okay. Know, so sort of how do you present yourself as a category? Of <laughs> yeah. CA, yeah. Okay. So I, to try and remember those questions. So I got into it because after my PhD, I was thinking, What's an area that I could now research that, that people haven't really looked at? And I'm a psychologist by background. Um, and it was one of those accidental things like everything in life. I met someone who knew someone who worked at the mediation, local mediation center. I was thinking, oh, no, for disputes. I was very committed to not doing an interview-based ethnographic kind of approach. I wanted to collect naturally occurring data. Psychologists haven't looked at neighbor relationships. So I thought, right, neighbor relationships is going to be my thing. Um, over several years then pursued um, mediation centres, and then I was thinking, you know, where else, where, where might I find half Swedish? You know, where might neighbours interact with each other as neighbours? Into mediation to the environmental health. So I've got lots of calls into environmental health services, many neighbours. Um, then I've got the antisocial behaviour unit of the council, where people are again, you know, the same sorts of problems are formulated, but to different institutions with different amounts of legal or pseudo legal powers. And then the police access, which obviously took a long time to get that material. Um, so I was interested in neighbour relationships specifically and how different institutions kind of manage neighbour conflict. Um, so that was my initial interest. Be this makes this makes it this. I don't know. This might sound not that good, but I I, I genuinely like going back to the organisations and saying this is the kind of thing I'm finding. You're obliged to do that anyway because the res the research has all been funded by uh, research councils. Um, but they kind of slowly, and, and then at one, at one moment I learned how to do the thing in PowerPoint where you make it all arrive separately. <laughs> so, and, and then that seemed to really work, you know, with, with, with the, um, the media. And then it suddenly occurred to me, well, actually, I can do what I did and just stop it and make them role play it. Oh, and then, okay, so role play has all been on hypothetical scenarios and simulations, it's quite different. And it, it evolved in a really ad hoc way, mm -hmm. like life, you know, on terms of like, oh, I can do this in PowerPoint. And like, Oh, you know, I need to go back to the, 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 the people and, and tell them what I'm finding, and, and ooh, okay, now I can do this. Yeah. And then, but of course, all grounded in various empirical interests I've had in the material. Um, in terms of saying anything at all about CA, I say nothing about CA. But I present the transcripts and I sort of say, very quickly, this is going to become very readable to you. You're going to start to notice that a row of C's means the mediator is should be doing something, and a row of M's means the caller isn't doing anything. Um, and you know, a, a 0.5 gap is going to start to sound like a delay um, and they start to understand you know this uh, like a 2.5 gap is a seriously tumbleweed moment but they it's not intuitive again 
Um, so it all seems to work very well. And, and of course, um, unlike you know, student audiences or academic audiences, they don't have baggage to bring about CA and its fiddly transcripts and why would you do that? And you don't deal with power, do you, or society? Um, they, they don't ask those questions because they're not, they're just like lapping it up. And, and they've never looked at their own practice. Um, so they just do role play, they video their role play, um, but they don't ever look at mediators actually solving problems. I was wondering if you could comment on your um, impact regarding the group performance, especially with the people that you've been dealing with. Say again, sorry. Your, I can't your think. impact regarding improved performance. Yeah. Especially with the people that you've been dealing with. Can you would you want to make any comment in that direction? Um, if I understand your question, um, I, I I'm when I run these workshops I very explicitly position myself as a as a as a professional of a different kind to the types of professional that the mediators are. And I say that I'm not into trying to tell them how to do things. Um, but it's a delicate balance because obviously what, 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 what I'm showing them, for instance, how, you know, the way mediators will explain mediation, which leads to rejection. And I can, I can look up, I can show them various ways in which um, this type of formulation of mediation seems to produce a positive outcome. Um, and this sort of way of formulating it seems to produce a negative outcome, but I want them to come up with stuff. I'm trying not to be critical and or, or say, I let them do all of that. My, I, I try to see myself as someone who's giving them materials with a, with a wink um, and letting them come up with stuff as much as possible. Just, so I'm not trying to, um, I wouldn't be assessing them and I wouldn't be making recommendations. The whole idea is I can present different ways of dealing with a racist caller or different ways of explaining the mediation process or different ways of making the offer and letting them see this one is the one that we want and this one, we don't like this one so much. And then hopefully, I mean, you know, the feedback that I get um, tells me that they're trying to at least incorporate this into subsequent training or they have lots of volunteer mediators and they sort of say, you know, when you're going to make the offer, this might be a way to do it. And if, you, if you're going to have a, if you've got a problematic call, you can do this or this and we like this one and this service or something like that. Yeah, one, one thing I'm looking at now is um, I'm looking at um, simulation because I got interested in role play and how no one's ever asked the question, how authentic is role play? So I've got, because I've got the police data, which is recorded by the police officers in the situation, in the station, n never for a social scientist to be inspecting. They just, they, these are old tapes, like from a, a couple of years ago, dead cases, so they, I have those. Um, and then the police to train um, get in ac actors to play suspects and, and do the scenarios. And they try to make it, they work the whole thing to be as authentic as possible. So they use the same interview rooms, they use the same tape machine, they sign and seal the tapes in exactly the same way. And because police interrogation, I guess it's the same over here, is partly governed by um, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, in which you have to get suspects to identify themselves, you have to identify yourself on the tape, you have to explain their rights to representation, and then you have to elicit their narrative, you, you have to do certain actions. You would imagine that role play could be massively authentic because they know what they have to do, so we have to sort of get the name on, on tape and all the rest of it. Um, but it turns out, um, nicely for me, with my, <laughs> on my kind of horse raging against role play and simulation, that they look quite different. So eliciting a suspect's name um, in the real thing, you know, for the benefit of the tape, could you please state your name and address versus a simulation which is something like, would you mind terribly, this could be a British thing as well, please, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, could you possibly uh, identify yourself? And that doesn't elicit the same information. And then what you get in the real one is that they kind of, they separate out the institutional stuff, like for the benefit of the tape, can you do this? And then say, right way, and move on and use their name. Whereas in the simulation, they do this terribly, you know, terribly polite, would you mind, low entitlement, we don't really, you know, we can't be asking this stuff. And then they say, and would it be okay if I used your first name? So they don't—they just don't have the same ways of, of, of sort of eliciting the information. And what you end up with is, you know, massively extended sequences in the simulation, and for all practical purposes, truncated ones in the real thing. Because in the real, in real life, you do things shorter. Um, and then the suspects themselves, who are actors, I mean, are hilarious. But, and you have to think, well, this is this is why 
we can't really interview to find out about the will because the actors who are suspects have got no stake in it at all, apart from pulling off a performance. You know, they're not going to get charged at the end of it, so they can do what they like. A real suspect can't. And you can see that, like, so in response to the first question about, um, so, you know, tell me the events from today leading up to your arrest, a real suspect will orient straight away to the, to the key moment of the day. Whereas the fake suspect, I mean, I've got, the data is both disgusting and but hilarious. So got up, went to the toilet, had a poo, <laughs> wiped my ass, went to Tesco, and, and that's how it goes. And you're just thinking, how is the police officer not just laughing their head off? <laughs> but also, no suspect will ever do that. You know, at least in, in like 120 that I've got, they just don't do that. They don't mess around. They don't. They don't take questions where it's kind of um, form over function. They they go with function every time, and they and they don't sort of subvert the process. Um, whether or not anyone's ever gonna be interested or really care about the finding, I don't know. But I like it. I think it's really fascinating to look at the differences um, and actually at least try to address the question which no one seems to ask so far. I'll, I'll keep talking if you will. <laughs> Just tell me to stop. Yeah, yeah. Talking about authenticity, I don't. Um, is there a specific reason you included the studying study of um, sitcoms because it really mirrors reality, but sometimes it's exaggerating how it works. Is it like by exaggerating reality or being irony? Yeah. So. As to what Chandler said in that uh, specific situation, I don't know whether in real situation people would say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Phoebe's turning down the invitation. If that was you know, real life, then you you would get some. You wouldn't get like the whole group laughing their heads off unless it was unless you already had that context of. Mm -hmm. like, well, you can imagine. You, you can never say never in, in interaction. Anything can always happen. Um, but. Yeah, the reason that I started to get interested in sitcoms was was purely as a as a teaching tool for to teach students about CA because you can look. At, I've got loads of these extracts where you've got pre sequences, you've got invitations being offered, compliments being like responded to in weird ways, and you can and the laughter gives you the breach if you like. So the sitcom works oftentimes in terms of breaching something that we all know about how interactions should unfold, um, and without having any technical expertise, you can kind of see it. Um, so I wrote about this um, in an article in, in Social Semiotics about the way um, breaches work um, to generate humour in sitcoms. And it's this very familiar device, but also it then helps you understand CA as well and, and, and the kinds of sort of sequential uh, organisation, the way that can be exploited by scriptwriters. So in terms of its authenticity, I think you're right that it's some kind of like ex exaggerated, maybe not exaggeration, but or ironic take on things that it's built for a sitcom. We all know it's a sitcom. We all know there's going to be gen humour generated. And in other situations, you can imagine them looking quite different and being rude and being oriented to in different sorts of ways. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of forced for studying it in terms of the scriptwriter's display of their understanding of how talk works and what you can, not both in terms of sequences and in terms of plausible scenarios. You know, what works, um, assuming that it does. You know, what makes a sitcom and its scenarios work versus not work. Oh, sorry, your, your question is. Say again. Sorry. I'm wondering what kind of um, role the, your, your background in psychology plays in your research. Okay. Um, next to none. Um, I mean, I did a very, very traditional psychology degree. Um, and then, um, again, it's one of these haphazard things where, you know, you, after you have a neat narrative. But in fact, what happened was I had my degree in psychology needed to do something else, applied for everything in the paper that had psychology in it as a postgrad thing, didn't really even know what a PhD was at the time, God, God, God knows how I got, got a studentship randomly, um, and it just happened that everything fell into slot because 
the, the, the lecturer that somehow saw something in me that with that, you know, this kind of completely um, naive person being interviewed for a studentship without really knowing what I was really even applying for. Um, she was interested in uh, students' interaction, and I got interested in student interaction uh, in, in university classrooms, which is one of the things that Hanson and I have in common. Um, but I was, I was completely reading everything in a random way. I mean, my supervisor was also a psychologist, so she gave me Harvey Sachs reflections at some point. But you can imagine if you've never encountered that, you're not a sociologist or a linguist, you don't have the background. I was reading anything with discourse analysis in the title, anything that kind of seemed loosely relevant to interaction linguistics, and I, I had this world out there I didn't, couldn't really navigate for a long time. Um, I started to be interested in gender differences in the way the men talk and the women talk. I was interested in social linguistics. Didn't somehow just didn't feel right and just didn't really like it. Started reading the lectures, started to understand perhaps I could look at how categories are made relevant in interaction and trying to do it that way. Um, but basically now, I mean, I don't. I teach psychology. I'm in a, a social sciences department, but teach psychology. Um, and I don't know if any of you know um, Loughborough Social Sciences or know any of my colleagues at Loughborough, Derek Edwards and Charles Antarki and Alexa Hepburn, John Potter. Basically, we're a bunch of people who um, got and, and Derek and Jonathan, Dr. John Potter and Derek Edwards, kind of invented this thing called discursive psychology which was to psychology what CA and ethno was to sociology, which is the respecification of psychological matters, if you like, using ethno and CA. Um, and so discursive psychology is, is, the, is the nearest I get to psychology these days in terms of my actual uh, writing. Um, yeah, I think you need a good supervisor who can like short, give you lots of shortcuts at the start. I mean, the only advantage of reading widely <laughs> in which women talk like this and men talk like that. That kind of evolved with the more general sort of postmodern, post-structuralist turn to discourse into interactional sociolinguistics and all of those traditional people who did sociolinguistic language and gender stuff started to talk about the performance of um, femininities in plural, masculinities in plural. Um, and, and there are many ways of performing, being a woman, various ways of performing, myriad ways. Um, but I, I found that sort of strangely dissatisfying in that um, you're still kind of looking, you're still looking at, okay, let's look at the way people perform gender or perform um, class or perform what, whatever identity category it is that you're interested in. And you still end up imposing something on that material. And gender in particular, you know, if, if you've got some material and you're looking at the different ways in which um, women perform femininity, um, at what point are they not performing femininity and are they doing something else? Um, and it, you know, when you look at um, lots of studies around identity construction and gender, there's never a moment in which something else could be happening. Um, it's always that if, if, if the gender doesn't look like the standard thing, um, then you just need some other word for this type of femininity or this type of masculinity. Uh, but it's never the case that it's just not relevant at all. And so th through all of that, I became really dissatisfied with constructionist accounts of gender as well, in that they just didn't seem to take you very far away from a, a dichotomy between, OK, so we're not going to do an essential, this people are behaving this way because they're a man or because they're a woman. It became this kind of fluid, dynamic, multiple shifting identities, but still masculinity or femininity. 
or with a few extra variables thrown in, but the standard ones, you know, class or sexuality or age or ethnicity. Um, and you're not getting very far away from those big sort of variables. And so in the so my thing has never really been to particularly look at identity in that way. It's been to look at things like the police data that you saw, where people are making gender relevant. And re forget whether they are a man or a woman in particular. Let's look at the way they attend to their own identity as a man or a woman and then use that to do something. And so that's where I have ended up on that particular journey.